Good morning, church family. I hope you are well. I hope you managed to have a break over the Easter period. Uh, Chris is going to come and share uh, a message with us today. So, Chris, I'm really looking forward to what you have to share. And thanks for the time you spent uh, preparing um, today's message. Um, let me open in prayer. Father God, just thank you that we can um, come together as church. We can come together without fear of persecution. We can come and worship in prayer, in song. And Lord, just open our ears and penetrate our hearts as we hear from your word today. In your name, Jesus. Amen. So I don't believe it's a coincidence that I am worship coordinator this morning. I believe that God wants me to share um, a reading from the Psalms with you. Um, so, yeah, just as I share from Psalm 27, just be in a, an attitude of prayer. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord. This only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent I will sacrifice. With shouts of joy I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Saviour. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. So I believe that God wanted me to share that with you um, this morning. I really hope, I really hope you you've um, you're able to take some some comfort uh, from that. Um, so I've chosen a couple of songs uh, this morning. One of them is a song by Stuart Townend called How Long. Um, for me, that is um, that is just um, a, a prayer. Um, and I've used that song as a prayer. I, I think they're really powerful, powerful words. Um, and I hope you see uh, why, if you're not familiar with that song. Uh, and the other song is Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. So let's, um, yeah, let, let's sing. Um, uh, in an attitude of worship.
Lord, we know your heart is broken by the evil that you see. And you stayed your hand of judgment for your plan to set men free. But the land is still in darkness, and we fled from what is right. We have failed the silent children who have never seen the light.
Good morning. I'm going to start off with um, a little bit about the persecuted church. As you know, I do like to uh, keep up to date on, on what is happening around the world. And the situation in Nigeria is getting gradually worse, especially in the north of the country, where earlier this month, one Christian was killed and four injured and four young women were abducted when a group of bandits attacked a church bus. Last month, eight other ladies were abducted on the same stretch of road from another church bus. But, praise the Lord, these have since been released. In Pakistan, two Christian nurses have had to be rescued by police after mobs were threatening them for blasphemy. All they had done was remove a stick uh, with a Quranic verse on it from the door, the locker door of a senior nurse while they were cleaning the locker room. They had apologised and given the sticker back to the nurse concerned but she still accused them of blasphemy. A mob were formed and the police had to come and rescue these two nurses. But sadly, since then, both of them have been charged under Pakistan's notorious blasphemy law and now face long prison sentence. So Lord, we just hold these two situations up to you, the situation in Nigeria, the ladies who've been kidnapped. We ask Lord for their safety for their safe return to their homes and families. We pray, Lord, that while they're in uh, captives, that you would be with them, they would know your presence with them and you would bless them. We pray, Lord, for those who are doing the kidnapping, that they would find Jesus and that they would return, they would turn to him and uh, repent of their ways and stop all these attacks upon Christian and other people in Nigeria and other parts of the world. We think of the situation in Pakistan and we pray, Lord, for the many Christians who are held under this notorious blasphemy law, which many people use just to get revenge on somebody. And it is very common for Christians to be accused of blasphemy. And uh, many are murdered under uh, the pretense of blasphemy. So, Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Pakistan and in Bangladesh, which is nearly as bad. We ask, Lord, again, that you will be with them, that they would know your presence with them at this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Myanmar, the situation for catching Christians is absolutely dire, and there are reckoned to be up to 20,000 hiding in the jungle. They have to move on every couple of days before the army finds them. They have very little to support and very little ways of supporting themselves, no medicine, anything like this. And it is a dire situation for them. The army have also started interrupting church services and searching the church buildings on the pretense of searching for leaders of the opposition movement. But in fact, all they're trying to do is uh, stop church services and prevent church from taking place because they are basically a Buddhist country. So, Lord, we again pray for the situation of the Kachin Christians and the whole situation in Myanmar. Lord, you know what's happening. You know the beginning from the end. We just ask that you would strengthen and bless those who are persecuted. That, Lord, those who need aid will be able to find aid and those who are wanting to deliver aid will be able to deliver it and get it through to the people. So we hold up the people of Myanmar to you at this time. And we pray, Lord, that the... Um, international situation and the governments will take action against the military leaders in Myanmar. So Lord, all this we give to you, to your praise and glory. Amen. And very good news from Iran. I would like to just read a couple of uh, extracts from a letter I've just received from Elam Ministries. It starts off to say that recently Fatima visited friends who were participating in one of our online women's conferences. As a teacher of the Quran, Fatima was unfamiliar with what was being taught. Something about what she overheard struck her. Soon after, she wrote to us, I have never heard such wonderful things. There is so much blessing in what you say. The Lord, we just pray that she would uh, go further and that she would become a Christian, giving her life to you. And then uh, there's a lady 
or, uh, by the name of Samira, who had shared the gospel with her family many times but with no response. She felt discouraged that her loved ones had heard but had not believed. One day, Samira's sister, Anahita, became very sick. It softened Anahita's heart and she gave her life to the Lord. Soon after, Anahita had a dream where Jesus said to her, your faith has made you well. She woke up and in time she was healed. When the rest of the family heard that Anahita had been healed, they called Samira, who led them all in the prayer of salvation together. Uh, it's wonderful to hear of how the Lord is working in places like Iran and how the, the church is growing there. And one last story. Um, Ali and Awa Avra felt the Lord's calling to plant a church in their hometown in Iran. Their family back home was divided, but they faithfully called each relative to share Jesus's forgiveness with them. One by one, family members came to faith and were reconciled. Others heard, and within a few months, Ali and Avra had established two house churches. Again, Lord, we just want to thank you for what you're doing in Iran. We just want to pray for the people of that country. And we just thank you, Lord, that you are moving in a powerful way and that many, many people are getting very fed up with the Islamic government and are wanting to see a new and different way forward. So, Lord, as we just uh, finish this time of praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters, we just thank you, Lord, for the wonderful things that you're doing. And we just thank you, Lord, that um, their favourite book, the persecuted church's favourite book, is Revelation. Because in Revelation, Jesus wins. So, Lord, we just thank you and pray for the brothers and sisters in Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses' righteousness being restored And oh, these are days of great trial Of famine and darkness and storm Still we are the voice in the desert Crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. Lift your voice, the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. Dry bones becoming this flesh And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise Oh, these are the days of the harvest For the fields are as wide in your world And we are the laborers in your are declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. Lift your voice, the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation The name Elijah means the Lord, he is God. So just sing along with us. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. 
There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till So before Sharon comes and shares the reading with us and before Chris comes and shares the message, let me lead us in prayer. Father God, we, uh, we just know there is so much need in the world, so many people struggling. Lord, we pray for the persecuted church. We pray for our brothers and sisters under attack. Lord, we pray that you give them hope. We pray that they see how much you love them. And we pray that they will share the gospel and fearlessly tell others about Jesus. Lord, we remember the royal family on the passing of Prince Philip. We pray that you strengthen them as they grieve the loss of a husband, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and come alongside them in this time of grief. Lord, we ask that you continue to guide us through this pandemic. We pray for your ongoing protection and we thank you for science and the discovery of vaccines which are now being rolled out across our communities. And we hope and look forward to the day we can come together physically as church again. Lord, take away any fears that we may have around the virus, the vaccine, or the circumstances in our lives that have occurred as a result of this pandemic. Continue to walk with us as we go through these difficult days. And Lord, we um, pray for our community and our church family. Make us attentive to the needs of others, whether physical Emotional, mental, spiritual, financial. Speak to us about the needs of our brothers and sisters and our community. Lord, we lift these prayers up to you now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Today our reading comes from Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 32, the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, 
There was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet no one gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. Come to share the thoughts, Lord, that you have put on my heart. I just pray that the thoughts that are of you and the words that are of you will take root and grow. And anything, Lord, that is of me will just disappear into the ether and go nowhere. So, Lord, may this time just be a blessing to you, Lord. And when you bless, Lord, those who are hearing it. In Jesus' name. Amen. I thought today we'd have a look at a well-known Bible passage, but not quite from the same angle as it's normally looked at. Our emphasis will not be on the lost son, but on the elder brother. Saying that, there is one striking point about the reaction of the father in the story that we in the Western world of today might not appreciate. In that part of the world then, and in, still in some places today, men of position or authority do not run anywhere. It's simply too undignified. Yet in verse 20, we see that he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him. Again, in that region, it was very undignified for men to show such emotion, let alone the fact that his son would have quite probably been very smelly. In fact, he would have probably smelled quite high. This all points to how far a heavenly father will reach out for the lost. Reach out in the form of Jesus, who, to quote from Hillsong, from heaven came running from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. If he is prepared to go to such lengths for the lost, shouldn't we? Good little thought to think on, something that I need to reflect on myself. So the main character we're going to look at today is the elder brother. How many of us, I wonder, find it easy to identify with the younger brother? But after all, a lot of us have squandered what God gave us, but now come back to him. And he has welcomed us with open arms. So yes, it's quite easy to um, associate and identify ourselves with the younger brother. But actually, we are the older brother. 
Jesus at that time was referring to the Pharisees as the older brother, which today equates to us in the church. So let's look first at what that means for the church. Somebody once said that Christ, new Christians are like little babies, smelly and dirty at one end, noisy and dirty at the other end. So when a new or immature Christian walks through our doors, we should be like the father in the story, embracing and kissing them on both cheeks, having a party for them, nurturing them and discipling them, which may not only involve answering some tricky questions, but quite possibly means examining our own thoughts, actions or traditions. Now, while I personally think that Heal Lane Chapel is quite good at doing this, that doesn't mean that we can sit back on our haunches and be complacent about it. As culture, society and seasons change, we may well need to adjust the way we present the gospel and disciple people. Let me make it clear. The message has not changed one iota. Just possibly the way we present it needs to change. And just as an aside, on Saturday the 15th of May, Premier Christian Radio are hosting a live online seminar entitled Unbelievable. Its subject, how to tell the greatest story ever told. And there are many good evangelists and apologists uh, will be on this seminar giving tips and helps uh, and ideas of the way, way forward in society today. You can find details for this seminar online. However, that was an aside. What we need to be very careful about is not to become like the elder brother, which sadly some churches are. He refused to even try and forgive his brother all he could see was the injustice in his younger brother's actions when in asking for his share of the estate, he had not only weakened the financial position of the estate, but in no uncertain terms, implied that he wished his father was dead so he could have his share. In verse 21, we see that even though the younger brother had repented, the older one had allowed bitterness to kill any love or compassion for his brother. Now I'm actually going through a season of forgiving or having to learn to forgive at the moment. And I, I've always known that forgiving isn't just a case of being like a little child. I'm saying I'm sorry and going off and doing it again or forgetting about it. Forgiving, truly forgiving is difficult. Just over a year ago, uh, my business was offered the opportunity to expand up into Berkshire and Oxfordshire. And we were given several guarantees or guarantees of work from several different people. And we invested a lot of money. Uh, unfortunately, both these people have let us down. One of us has kicked us in the teeth quite badly. And uh, the ex planned expansion is gradually fizzling out. I'm really struggling to forgive. Um, I've tried to understand why they've done what they've done, but understanding and forgiving are different things. And if I don't forgive, I also would allow bitterness to kill any love or compassion for my brothers and sisters in Christ involved in this situation. So forgiveness is hard, but if we don't, it's even worse. Now, Many new Christians have led pretty unsavory lives up to the point of their conversion, and they will need help and time to change. Now, this is where we have to put aside our own preferences, fears and prejudices, whilst at the same time being wise and prudent in how we help them to develop. For example, if someone has been involved in embezzlement, making them church treasurer may not be the brightest idea. We need to help them slowly develop any good traits as well as any new ones that become apparent with time alongside helping them get rid of any traits that are not so good, always remembering that there is every chance they will slip and fall. If they do, 
we have to be there to lovingly and compassionately help them get back up and carry on with their journey. And this is not always easy, as we all well know. It is something that we need to do and need to do on a regular basis. Now, if we look at chapter 28, we see that the older son is angry and refuses to go in. This is so disobedient and highly disrespectful to his father. And it puts him in the undignified position of having to go out and plead with his son. How do we treat newcomers who on the face of it do not match up to our own expectations? A couple of examples I can give of are a couple of churches uh, where I've, before we moved down here, one particular church, and we weren't actually at this service, where a gentleman of the road came in and uh, sat in a pew the church warden as greeting to him was in this church we ask men we expect men to take their hats off as he left the church as the uh, gentleman of the road left the church after the service he was heard to say he got a better christian reception in the tea van up on the main london portsmouth road we don't we expect people to come and be what we want them to be and not how they are we don't try and meet them where they are and find what they want, what they need. Another example is at a different church, and I was at this one, and um, this particular church was a, a typical Anglican church building, and they had no facilities, so they met for coffee after every service in the village hall, which was on the other side of the road. So after this service, everybody left, and outside, sitting on a bench, was another gentleman of the road. Everybody walked past him but I felt that I should try and just do something. So I stopped and I chatted to him briefly and I said, would you ask me if you'd like to come over for a cup of tea or coffee? But he declined, but he said he would love one if I wouldn't mind bringing it over to him. So I went over and got him a cup of coffee and a biscuit and went back and started chatting to him a bit more. And he told me he was on his way to Liphook, which was about 10 miles away from where we were. I don't know why he was going there, what his plans were, I don't know. But he was saying he had a problem uh, with his shoes and I looked down and sure enough uh, the sole was hanging off his right shoe and it was seriously hanging off. I looked at his feet, I looked at my boots and I had on my favourite Vokes boots which I just spent rather a lot of money having resold and rehealed. And I thought Lord do you want me to? Yes I've got to. So I said to him look my car's just over there. I can, you know, easily go to that without my boots on. So why don't you try my boots? And if they fit, you can have them. And uh, he very said, thought that was very kind of me. And he tried to get them on. You can imagine my relief when they didn't fit. But anyway, the point I'm making is the church tried to do something. And um, I did then offer him a lift to Lipport, but he didn't want it. He said, no. He'd make his own way in his own time and he'd try and find something to do about his boots. And off he went. So this is how, you know, we should welcome these people and find out where they are and if or how we can help them. Again, this is fairly obvious, but it's not always convenient and it's not always pleasant. In verse 31, we see the father's response. My son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Now let's let these words sink in. Everything I have is yours. This is what God is promising us and it's available to us now. How amazing is that? How we approach this may well be based on how our earthly father dealt with us. Now my father ran a retail dairy and I worked for him for many years. And just after we got married, Penny and I got married, my father retired and I took the business over. My father came up virtually every day, certainly four or five days a week. And he was incredibly short-sighted. So he would walk into the office and I would be doing office work as one does or whatever it might be. And he'd start picking bits of paper up and. He had to sort of look at everything like this to be able to read it. 
and he'd put it down somewhere else. And he would answer the telephone and, uh, oh, and he would promise things that I maybe have sort of sorted out, and all sorts of things like this. And it used to drive me mad. But, you know, it was my father's only interest. He had nothing else than his work. But he was not only interested, he was also wanting to guide, to give me the wisdom of his 40 odd years in the retail dairy industry. And of course, I was just a young whippersnapper who thought he knew it all. And you know, God is like that with us. He's not only interested in what we're doing, but he wants to be our guide. 2 Corinthians 1.20 tells us, all God's promises are yes in Christ. As we look at the world around us, how hard it can seem to believe that. But all of God's promises are yes in Christ. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that amazing? And as I look out on this glorious day at the beauty of his creation around me, I just marvel at how great a God we have. But, you know, Proverbs 29, verse 25, also gives us a clue as to why we might find it hard to sometimes claim these promises. It said, fear of man is a great snare. Now, how often do we try and not be too obvious with our faith? Another little example. Um, my business partner, is uh, he and his wife are just a, a modified, a, a or we built a, a small house and uh, they are in need of a mortgage and uh, the uh, mortgage broker was around their house the other Friday evening and they were sorting their mortgage out and that was fine. Off he trundled um, and they went out about 10 minutes later to find this man lying dead in their drive. Now obviously it's upset them both quite, uh, quite a lot and I spoke both to my business partner and his wife. Um, on separate occasions about it. And I knew this was an opportunity and I fluffed it. I just, that's all I can say, I fluffed it. They know where I stand. Did I offer Christ? Did I offer his comfort, his peace, his grace? I tried to, but in such a way, because I didn't want to be too obvious and I didn't want to risk upsetting them. Yes, fear of man is a great snare. Be bold. Remember, God's word never returns to him void. Now, verse 32 tells us to celebrate and be glad. The elder son had every opportunity to celebrate his comfortable and honored position with his friends, but he didn't take it, possibly because he thought his father wouldn't approve. As a church, how often do we truly celebrate our Father, our Heavenly Father, and the inheritance that is ours? I'm not talking about a weekly religious service. I'm talking about putting church matters to one side and really having a party, celebrating who and what our Heavenly Father is. You know, sometimes at prayer meetings, I say to you, let's start this meeting off by just praising God. And I might start the prayer off and I might praise him for a few minutes. And I suddenly find myself throwing that little question. In, oh, Lord, could you do this? Oh, Lord, could you do that? Why is it so difficult just to praise God? Some years back, Penny and I went to a New Year's Eve party at Holy Trinity Bompton in London. And we got there about nine o'clock and for three hours, we basically just worshiped God. Yes, there was some prayer giving thanks for what had happened in the past year. And yes, there was some prayer asking for things to happen in the new year. But it was a party just celebrating God and it was wonderful. And I suppose the other time I've really seen this is at gatherings and meetings or services at the end of mission. When again, we're just praising God. We're just thanking him for what's happened that week. We're just thanking him for life's changed, for people saved, 
the people who are coming through to salvation. It is just so wonderful to have these prayer and praise meetings and just nothing else. Just praise God. It's such a wonderful thing. We don't do it often enough, in my mind anyway. So, to coming towards the end, how do we view God? Do we view him as a harsh taskmaster? Or a God who is waiting for us to come to him to bless us with his presence and grace? Like me, many new Christians, the devil has convinced that God is a harsh taskmaster. And it has taken me years, and on occasion it is still taking years, for me to really see my heavenly father for who he is. Somebody who wants to pour out his abundance, his grace, his love. He wants me to claim my inheritance. He wants each of us to claim our inheritance now. In preparation for when Jesus comes back and we will be part of running the new heaven and the new earth. How do you see our Heavenly Father? I'd like to finish now with a quote by Kate Waterman about the prodigal son that I recently read. It says this, this parable confronts us over our concept of God. Do we believe in a God who is disposed to bless his children abundantly or one who gives us just enough to get by? I know how I want to believe in God. I want to believe in him. And I'm sure nearly all of you want to believe in him. No, in fact, I'm sure all of you want to believe in him as somebody who is disposed to bless his children abundantly. Amen.